Talk to me about why it is important to you to have a candidate that's identifying explicitly as socialist or communist. Like, what does that mean to you substantively, not just as a, an add-on label? I think it's, you know, if you look at our platform, for example, we are the, I, I believe we're the only, very humbly, we are the only campaign with a credible anti-inflation program. Mm. Um, we're talking about, if we think about the, the inflation reports that have come out recently, gas prices are driving inflation, you know, and seizing the top 100 companies that include the 11, like the 11 of the biggest energy companies with a combined $197.5 billion in profits, seizing that could definitely help the inflation that we are currently suffering from. When we're talking about, you know, exactly only socialism can save you at, at the pump. Like it gets better because the top 100 companies that include Walmart, Tyson Food, Amazon, Ford, Ford um, and, and you could go up and down. Those would belong So the people actually producing the wealth and we would control the ways in which that wealth is actually invested. That's socialism. When we're talking about healthcare, just seizing again, seizing the top 100 corporation. A lot of these uh, top 100 corporations include the largest health insurers, several of the largest pharmaceutical companies and drug distributors, the largest hospital company in Texas and Florida. CVS, Walgreens, what would happen if we were to do that? If that were to be in control, again, of the people that are producing the wealth and not just the people that are sitting, accumulating wealth based on our exploitation. At some point we have to say, we're not negotiating our exploitation anymore. We're taking over what belongs to us. And that's socialism. We had a, we uh, discussed this on the podcast, I think um, last spring, spring of 2022, precisely because of the conversation around uh, gas prices. I think I had Matt Brunig um, and another economist on to talk about the possibility and the logistics of seizing uh, oil and gas companies and implicitly other kinds of businesses that were engaging in price gouging and and driving up inflation. And I direct Mm -hmm. people back to that conversation because I did think it was important to, it can seem very radical to the capitalist American ear and having experts kind of walk it through and talk about examples of where similar action has been taken in other countries and the ways in which it's benefited the people and what pitfalls might exist and and how to address people's concerns is, is, is what we're going to have to do to make solutions like that seem more plausible and at least Mm -hmm. on the table as part of Mm -hmm. our political discussion, because it also is the case that there have been moments in history where even the threat of nationalization has forced some of these companies to be less greedy. Um, and we saw that coming out of the New Deal era. So I really appreciate you, your willingness to go there and have that that kind of a, of a conversation. Um, yeah, go ahead, please. Just on that, like Nixon, which mm-hmm. was a conservative. Mm-hmm. In a moment of inflation, Nixon said, you know what? We're going to freeze mm-hmm. prices. And any mm-hmm. corporation that increases their prices is going to get something. They're going to, like, it, there is the possibility of controlling and regulating corporations. But for as long as we have this corporate duopoly that serves corporations, we're not going to be able to advance in this country. And so it is more than possible. There is Historically, there, there is a way of doing something about this inflation. There is something to be done around poverty in this country. There is something to be done around services that people so direly need. But the priorities are not there. Uh, you mentioned the big three uh, auto manufacturers and the ongoing strike. I wonder what you make of this uh, push for Biden to visit the picket line. That's largely coming in response to news that Donald Trump is going to be visiting Michigan, not going to the picket line, it seems, but uh, going there to speak to some uh, group of auto workers uh, as kind of counter programming to the next Republican debate. Do you think it's a good idea for Joe Biden to go? Do you think 
it is um, it would be misleading for him to go. I mean, what do you what do you make of the optics and the reality, the political reality of uh, of someone like Joe Biden's presence uh, on the picket line? Well, first, hopefully he doesn't fall asleep on the picket line. <laughs> <Bloody> <laughs> That's the first thing. Um, and the second piece is, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge things for what they are. Uh, professional politicians, corporate politicians will show up and will promise a lot of things. I mean, he promised a lot of things. And some people may argue, right, that how can he? You know, we're just coming out of a COVID crisis. We're just doing this. We're just, but we forget the record of Joe Biden. We forget that his record is brutal. It's criminal. You know, he called for social security cuts three times. Mm. <laughs> he, he attacked, mm. uh, you know, pensions. He has mm-hmm. supported fracking. He has, mm-hmm. he, he is part of the warmongering class of people in this country. We can't forget that. So when people are like, you know, oh, but he's done better things and anybody and everybody could do good things. And that that is relative. That does not solve the scale of the problems that people are facing. So he could go and he will go and he will show face, probably smile, probably, you know, get off script, cause some sort of, that will happen. But all of that is political theater. And it's political theater that we are, we've seen, again, pop up every four years because there's a lot of promises and then there's a lot of excuses for the things that cannot be done because not, and they don't say they can't be done because we don't prioritize it. What they usually say is that we lack the resources and who in their right mind can believe that there's a lack of resources in the wealthiest country in the world. Our problem is not lack. Yeah. We are abundant. We've stolen enough resources also across the globe to have enough. And so how are you going to say that there isn't enough money to have universal health care? How are you not going to say, like, how is there not money for infrastructure? How is it that we're not using the technology and the ways in which technology has advances for the, the, the benefit of working class people? That is ludicrous. So that they go, yes, they'll go. And they'll do what they do which is part, again, of the political theater and trying to bribe people, working class people, into voting for them and, and, and have our people put their hopes and dreams and aspirations into the same cycle that has been happening historically. And so I saw, I read, uh, I believe in uh, the Washington Post, a former Michigan a Governor James Blanchard, uh, in the context of this conversation about should Biden go or shouldn't he go, he said something that was sort of revealing. He said, quote, I'm not sure the president should be marching a picket line. You start one and you have to do the others. <laughs> so, I mean, it seems to be an acknowledgement that there there is tension being put. There's pressure being put in the Democratic Party right now mm-hmm. because some Republicans, at least Donald Trump, sees this as an opportunity for him to make a bid for working class voters that have been historically ignored by the Republican Party. It's a silly bid. It's a weak bid. I don't know how much any of the auto workers are likely to fall for it, but they're making a bid, which puts pressure on Biden to show up the same way that there was pressure on him to show up in East Palestine, pressure on him to show up in uh, Maui. But if you do this thing performatively only because Mm -hmm. you're being pressured by Republicans, does that mean you have to show up to all of them? Meaning does it mean you have to actually be a pro-union candidate and not just one every four years? Isn't that kind of a tell? That, that, I mean, it's very telling. It's very, very telling. He is one, he is one um, you know, union busting. <laughs> it's, right. Again, patterns in history. We just need to look at the patterns of the Democratic Party and the, the different levels of attack that the working class, including labor unions, have faced within the Democratic regime and rule in this country. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they they have historically done that. And they've actually occupied more seats than the Republicans throughout history, which is another reality. Yeah. And so what have they done for us if it's not bring us into this point? And again, the, I don't think the discussion or the conversation should be around blue or red or Democrat or Republican, because ultimately they are the same. And they they pray and they are accountable to the same God, which is profit. Mm. And we have to be clear about that 
And so if we're clear about that, then the only option is to build a third option. The only option is to build instruments of working class people, is to be able to work in coalition, is to be able to have a strategy to build and reorganize society in a way that works for us and stops working for them. But in order to do that, we need to seize what's ours. We need to take what's ours. You know, we can't, talk, a lot of folks um, in the in many different movements, we, we will continue to struggle. We will continue to fight for the very things that have been the reforms that we've earned, that we've struggled for. But that cannot be the end of our fight. That cannot, reforming capitalism is not and cannot, it should never be the end of our fight. Our fight is to build a new society, to reorganize a socialist society in this country that actually puts people at the forefront. It is inconceivable the amount of money, the trillions of dollars over the last 20 years, $21 trillion towards war. And that's not only war that happens out there. That war has repercussions in our communities. The lack of healthcare in our communities is directly connected to that. Foreclosures is connected to that. And so we can't continue in the same pattern and expect different results. We have to stand up and build something that is ours. You mentioned a, a moment ago uh, that it's not a red or blue issue, and you seem very open to uh, trying to recruit or reach out to working class people of all political backgrounds. The question of how to best do that recently um, was foregrounded in an exchange uh, between Cornell West and Jimmy Dore. I have no interest in mischaracterizing either side. People can listen to the clip them themselves. Maybe they can, uh, we can put a, a piece of it in here as well. To offer an alternative to the two major parties, to bring together disaffected members of those parties, along with independents and others who feel alienated from the political system as it exists. And, and the best way to do this is by running on economic issues that unite us, but which neither major party is willing to address because they're both beholden to the same powerful corporate interests. The Democratic Party long ago abandoned the working class in favor of beating the drum on cultural issues. And now that's all the Democrats have to run on. So if voters are looking for a party running on trans rights and calling Donald Trump and his supporters white supremacists, they can already vote for Democrats. The role of a third party is to focus not on the identity politics that divide us, but on core economic issues that unite us along class lines, like Christian Smalls did at Staten Island. Do you think he, he led with LGBTQ trans rights and white supremacy? Or do you think he organized along class lines? That's what we have to do. You have to organize, meet people where they are. That's a, So what is your plan to organize along class lines? Or are you gonna keep talking about white supremacy and all those identity politics, which are there, not from the ground up, from the top down, to make sure we stay divided. What is your plan to organize along class lines? Well, I appreciate, again, the clarity and candor of what you have to say. We have profound disagreements, brother. When I, when I, when I organize around white supremacy, I'm not making some utilitarian calculation. I'm speaking as a black man who comes out of a tradition that's been terrorized and traumatized by white elites. And that, that does not in any way mean it takes me away from class issue. Class issues are crucial. Trans, class issues are fundamental. But it doesn't mean that I'm putting up with white supremacy. One of the problems is that you get too many folk who want to talk class, 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 and can't say my mumbling word about white supremacy, police brutality, wow. can't say a mumbling word hardly. Or when they do say it, you call it identity politics as if it's not connected to class. I'm hitting these head on. Mm -hmm. I'm standing with the workers when it comes to strikes. I'm standing with the workers when it comes to greedy bosses. I'm standing with the workers when it comes to obsession with profits and the needs not in any way being satisfied. But I'll never for a minute be silent or not, or, or not raising my voice in terms of vicious treatment of black people, indigenous people, gay brothers, lesbian sisters, or trans. It's not an either or. And that's, that's where you and I have a deep, profound disappointment. But the crux of the issue was to what extent um, identity politics, quote unquote, identity politics uh, should be a part of someone's campaign pitch, whether or not it is counterproductive to be speaking in terms of white supremacy the way that Cornell West often does, 
whether that's alienating to voters. The question that wasn't asked, but that I would add to that is, is not referencing uh, white supremacy or um, identity-based attacks on various groups, alienating to members of those groups as they're looking to join various coalitions that might protect their interests. And how do you balance all of those competing interests as you're trying to put together a big tent, where in addition to economic issues, people do care about the more discrete concerns that may only affect discrete communities. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's important, and I appreciate you bringing that up because I think it's really important. Um, we need to operate from the society in which we live to be able to get to the society we want. So we, we need to be able to have a real assessment of the different identities and how the different identities have been historically marginalized, oppressed, exploited, um, and and find the ways of articulating the connection of all these different types of exploitation and oppression to what the organization of capitalism has been, and how capitalism, the one that has benefited from those types of oppression and exploitation. So I think it's very important to be able to speak about the attacks on Black America, for example. Like when we talk about slavery, it's not something that just happened out of the blue. It's it's state uh, slavery, shadow slavery was the down payment for the capitalist system in which we live. Colonialism was a down payment for the system that we now live in. The displacements, the breaking of bodies, Black and Indigenous, we need to name that. And we also need to name how it continues to happen. You know, we need to talk about the LGBTQAI community and the ways in which the rights, the the right wing, but also the liberals utilize the question of of trans folk to further divide as if they're not part of our community, as if the LGBTQI are not working class people, are not poor people. And so we need to, again, be really clear on the type of analysis being grounded on history and being grounded in the impact that these identities have suffered from a capitalist society. And so, again, I think it's highly important. I think that there is a danger though, to kind of just create fragments and leave those fragments, like, you know, not all black people are kin. Mm -hmm. I can't connect with an Obama, I -hmm. can't. Mm-hmm. Because his interests are not, they're not my, they're not my interests. Mm-hmm. His class interest is for bankers, for Wall Street. That that those are his people. They're not my people. And so I think we need to be clear on that. Just because we're talking about feminism and women's rights, it don't mean that everybody that's kind of using the same language is in the same position in a class society, and that our interests are aligned. And so I think that's where where the class analysis is important, where we're able to understand that society is organized by classes. Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot, um, especially after uh, Jimmy's made some subsequent statements in an interview with Nico House and others. And while I disagree, I think, with the tone and his approach in the initial exchange with Cornell West, obviously it is true, especially when you're talking about individual outreach, that you try to get a sense of what a person's interests and needs are and cater your pitch to them. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, agenda items for any Mm -hmm. progressive socialist candidate. And I'm not going to go up to a 20-year-old guy and say, well, reproductive rights is the number one thing if it doesn't seem like that's particularly his interest, right? And the same goes for any given identity category. India Walton, I think, was on this podcast a year or two ago talking about her approach as a Black woman knocking door to door, not necessarily saying, hi, I'm here to talk to you about LGBTQIA issues, if that didn't seem to be germane to the person's interest. But the difference between that and saying that Cornel West, when talking to Jimmy Dore and his audience, referencing white supremacy was somehow you know, shoving it down their throats or overemphasizing it. I don't know that was that that was fair to mm-hmm. Cornell West or his insight into how to communicate with a broad range of people, something that he has demonstrated quite successfully over the course of his career. And it, it concerns me that, le- that the left seems this many years into our discussion about identity politics, unable to tease out the difference uh, between weaponizing identity to mm-hmm. sell corrupt projects like 
hey, look how diverse the CIA is. <laughs> we're, we're, look, we're, we need mental health practitioners at Raytheon, you know? Um, the difference between that or the difference between Obama selling a corporate agenda with black skin and someone saying, hey, some of my issues are related to the fact that I'm a woman or the fact that I am black or the fact that I'm Latina or the fact that I'm trans or, you know, um, or the fact that I am differently abled and all these other kinds of things. And and I and I wonder what you make of how those issues are treated within PSL and among the broader left right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, in terms of the party, the party is a multinational party. Um, but within our our politics and at the very center of our of our work is the question of black liberation. <laughs> and not only black liberation in this country, but also black liberation internationally. And what does that mean? We follow and we work in solidarity with our comrades in Africa, for example, that are fighting against colonial rule. And that is part of our history. In the United States, we know and acknowledge, and some of our elders have direct connections to Black Panther folks and indigenous folks who are in prison um, because they fought for liberation. And so at the forefront, we have this question of Black liberation, indigenous liberation struggles, the question of women's rights, LGBTQ rights. And the reason that we have that is because we are also coming from those communities as a multinational party. So we have people who are representatives of those communities within the party who are organizing around those issues within. That makes a huge difference because you're not talking about convincing people. You have people who are that within the structure. And you have people who are conscious historically and who are conscious based on our experiences as poor, Black, immigrant, working class people. And so the agenda is shaped with that, from that. And it makes a huge difference because the debates are not necessarily around the question of like, well, you need to do this or you need to do that more. There's more of a unifying process because we understand where our oppression and exploitation comes from. Um, within that diversity, because there is a diversity. And so I think, you know, uh, so the question of like how the left operates, I I just want to push back and say the left is very broad these days. I get confused sometimes. Hell yeah, just tell me about it. (laughs) Because there are people that are like, we, I mean, I was watching, I was watching an interview of a so-called Brianna the other day and someone (laughs) said, the left and I was like wait a minute um I don't know if I am part of that left and so Uh, it happens to me every day people will be talking about like Amy Klobuchar talking about the left and I'm like who like it it, it brought in somewhere somewhere along the line yeah since I was 13 yeah it's been about 30 years at this point and I I this I just found out that that the left is that broad um (laughs) Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon.com slash podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.